Let me uh, keep you back in deep space for the next 20 minutes, last 20 minutes. Uh, I hope I will keep you interested in this talk. I know it was two intensive days. It's very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting discussions. I have a coffee break before. So thank you, thank you, Michael, for that. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, my work uh, for the deep space navigation for the part of part of the deep space navigation uh, function. Uh, dedicated to CubeSats. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the contributions by my uh, PI, Daniel Stroffer, and uh, from Perth Observatory, as well as the PI, uh, Kyle Kinsak, and uh, who are both in the room, Marco Agnon, Jordan Van Nitsen, who work in Taiwan, because it's a partnership with uh, Taiwanese University, uh, Chengkou University, and uh, Benoit Nasser, uh, also here. Uh, as head of CCR. Uh, so, in a very few uh, words, so the, 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 con the concept is made of three bricks, I would say, three technological bricks. The first one is an optical sensor, so we rely on optical measurements, and uh, that comes on top of this chart. So, with this optical sensor, we want to uh, have a measurement of the directions of foreground bodies front of the background of stars, and uh, if we could do that uh, simultaneously, then uh, we just we would just have to uh, triangulate, and then we could know where we are. But unfortunately, especially at CubeSat scale, we cannot expect to look at foreground bodies simultaneously. So, and we have to zoom, to point, to zoom again, and so on. So we have to make successive measurements, and during that time, we are moving, and then we have to reconstruct where we are from more than three measurements, uh, typically at least five, and then we can inverse the problem. That's the second brick. So first brick, optical sensor, second brick, triangulation, asynchronous triangulation. Unfortunately, the result of this uh, triangulation is uh, poorly accurate. Then we feed that, we fill a Kalman filter with that, and uh, with a sufficient number of iterations, we can expect to have a good orbit determination. So that's easy. And uh, so this work is part of a bigger uh, technology for full uh, navigation in deep space, so including uh, trajectory correction maneuvers that I won't take today. So uh, in a few years, we expect to have a, a full integration, a full engineering bench to, to test all components of that. And then uh, we are focusing uh, science cases for deep space. Uh, probably uh, asteroids uh, um, uh, at first, but we, will, we want also to test that in Earth's vicinity uh, uh, before going to, to deep space. Um, so I will concentrate my talk on orbit determination only. I know there are other parts in the GNT uh, technologies, so I will concentrate on orbit determination. And uh, I, historically, uh, we, we started with a context of in cruise, from Earth to Mars, but I would say also a word about uh, proximity operations at an asteroid. So just to give uh, uh, more context about the interest of this, uh, I have a science case that was uh, historically the, the first science case we had in mind, and uh, but it's just an example, there are other science cases. So we have in mind um, for deep space crews, a space weather science case, and so the idea is to uh, be piggybacked uh, on any uh, launcher that goes to Mars, and at the very beginning of the journey, we are jettisoned uh, from the host mission, and we are then completely autonomous on the Hohmann trajectory from Earth to Mars. That should be, yeah, you can see it, it's in green. And um, we can have a, a, a radiation detector on it, and uh, then you can orient it. To uh, any, uh, anyhow you want, because you are independent from the matter craft. And uh, if you uh, experience a particle that is uh, propagated from the sun, and that goes through a solar element, that goes through the Earth, then in the Hohmann trajectory, you will, the CubeSat uh, will be also in the same spiral shape line, and then you will also see that particle, so that solar event, from the CubeSat, so from two locations. And later in the Hohmann trajectory, it will be also the same. So if you have a solar event that reaches the CubeSat, 
you will be also experience that solar event from the Mars and Orbiter. So again, you will have a multi-location probing system. And uh, so, uh, so that's the idea for space weather from interplanetary uh, measurements to multiply um, uh, location for simultaneous uh, events. Well, uh, so the idea also is then to, to be completely autonomous from the, from the host mission and uh, to avoid any telecommunications with, uh, the, with any deep space network. Uh, because we, as we, it was told before, uh, we, we, we don't think we will really get a high priority for telecommunications. So we want to keep the data on board. And we, then our target is to be able to reach by ourselves uh, Mars. And uh, as a bonus science, if we uh, reach Mars with a sufficient, uh, sufficiently accurate uh, determination, we can, uh, we can uh, make a flyby that could, be, that, that could bring us back to the Earth. So, and then uh, we could have a, a double mission. But anyway, if we reach Mars, we expect to, make, to use a Martian orbiter to have a data relay for the, for, for the moment to, to, to get relayed back to the Earth. So the idea is to maximize the autonomy in deep space uh, without using uh, the so without relying on the on a deep space network. Uh, we have a mission profile, so I, I won't detail it right now. How how we will commission that? How we will uh, uh, operate it? Uh, what do we do with uh, the, the safe mode and so on? So I won't detail that. Um, what could be our requirement for that? So, well, uh, the literature suggested uh, as soon as uh, 2000 that uh, an orbit determination for NanoSat should reach some, something like 10 km accuracy if you are able to, uh, to, to update it frequently, and uh, 5 to 100 km if you have on board a very good propagator. So we decided that we should reach at least 100 km accuracy in deep space cruise. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, the concept is to make optical measurements from foreground bodies. So, we can see here a field of view uh, with the foreground bodies. So, here you have the same field of view, Earth, uh, moon, the Moon, and, uh, and Mars. And uh, uh, the idea is that you first, on ground, before the launch, computed an expected trajectory, TE. And this uh, expected trajectory is uh, stored on board before launch. And then, on board, you experience an actual trajectory, TA, that is uh, shifted from, the, from TE, and you try to reconstruct that shift. Okay. So, uh, because the shift is expected to be sufficiently small, you can linearize the problem and uh, expect to make a, a nice uh, matrix inversion. But before to go to that, we need a sensor. We need an optical sensor. And, uh, uh, common optical sensor, by the way, now this is here. Uh, uh, so, optical sensor uh, that you can expect at CubeSat and CubeSat uh, could be Star Tracker in a full frame mode, for instance, could be Imager. We had several presentations about that. Well, um, pixels for these kind of imagers uh, are typically at uh, a size of 10 arc seconds, so depending on the optical design. 10 arc seconds is a, good, uh, is a good number. Then you can expect to make a photo center of the foreground body here with an accuracy of a, a tenth of the pixel, so one arc second. And, but it's not enough, and we'll see that it's not enough. So we expect to make a so-called multiple cross-correlation in the optical sensor, and then it becomes a full um, astrometric payload. Uh, so the, the idea is to um, cross-correlate the location on the field of view, the location of the body compared to known stars in the field of view. And the more stars you, you have, uh, the better accuracy you get. And uh, so it, it goes with a, with a factor of a square root of n, n being the number of stars. And, but more, more interesting, and uh, we will use that in, in the next steps, you, you get also the covariance matrix of your measurements. And that's very, very interesting. With this, we can expect to reach some accuracy of optical measurements by 0.2 arc seconds. It's challenging, but it's fair. Then, second break. 
uh, we make a nice uh, linear linearized system of equations. So we have uh, uh, more equations than un uh, unknown. Uh, if you have five observations, so you can inverse the problem. And then the covariance matrix of the problem inversion, so then you have to assume a propagation model to link all measurements. Then you get a covariance matrix that, that is fed by the covariance matrix of the people sensor, and that's smart for the rest of the process. So then, but anyway, the accuracy is still quite bad. I, I would say about 1,000 kilometers, and we'll see it later. So 1,000 kilometers is not enough. Then second uh, step, and last brick, last brick is to fill a Kernel filter with that. Uh, though, so we, 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 we assessed that with the Kernel filter with very, very conservative uh, assumptions. And we now, uh, and then uh, I run the Monte Carlo simulations to see how our sensitivity is. So let's go to the results now. We built a um, study case uh, on the Earth mass scenario. So uh, I took a Earth, uh, I propagated an Earth mass trajectory uh, that is then called expected trajectory, TE. And I took the same initial conditions, removing one meter per second to simulate a, a retrograde jettisoning of the CubeSat at the beginning of the trajectory. And I propagate it again. And then I have two trajectories, TE and TA, that are slowly drifting one from each other. And then you have a, a, an increasing distance from... In, 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 uh, so. Uh, TE is known by the uh, algorithm, but TA is not known. And uh, TA is converted in directions, uh, so foreground bodies directions as seen from TA. Then that's what we simulated. And we tried to see if we can reconstruct TA accurately. Well, the answer is not so much accurately. So this is the asynchronous triangulation, so the raw results of that, so transversely. So along the trajectory, transversely from Earth to Mars over the time, uh, you get uh, this kind of uh, standard deviations, so one sigma. And longitudinally, it's, uh, it's even bigger, so up to 1,000 kilometers. So, okay. Then we add the layer of the kernel filter. And uh, we get very, very uh, promising results from here. So then transversely, we uh, have uh, uh, less than 100 kilometers, but uh, one sigma. And uh, longitudinally, it's a little higher, but still, uh, still fair. And you can see that it's diverging at the end, so probably we are not anymore in uh, the validity domain of this uh, algorithm. We also have a look in the behavior of the kernel filter itself. And uh, so in a green uh, dot, you have uh, the raw results of the triangulation. And in uh, red, you have the behavior of the kernel filter. And then you can see that the, the kernel filter ex um, makes excursions very far away from the raw measurements. So, and uh, that's not optimized at all. So, and then it starts converging, and then it's very good, very stable. Uh, you can also see that from uh, uh, successive Monte Carlo simulations, we have the same shape for a given, you take a given time in the scenario, and then for this, for that given time, you, you have the same shape, um, same behavior of Kalman filter, whatever the Monte Carlo simulation. So if we want to, to go to proximity context, we have to change some, uh, some parts of, of the approach. Then the science case itself is different. So the science case is that we want to be, so a uh, proximity proportion at an asteroid. Then we want to be deflected by a small mass, uh, M. So in order to do that, we have to fly quite close. And we expect to reconstruct data. But we, don't, we won't reconstruct data with the orbit determination. It will be reconstructed on ground. So the target for the autonomous navigation here is just to avoid collision and to get autonomy for at least one to two weeks for the CubeSat in order not to collide with the surface, with the other spacecraft that are operating. And uh, then that could make several multiple flybys, so multiple uh, uh, flying legs. 
Uh, in the vicinity of this asteroid, then to probe several uh, longitudes, uh, longitudes, latitudes. And from that kind of deflections that can be uh, measured by radio science from the ground and other data that could be post processed or on ground, then we expect to reconstruct the interior of the asteroid. So that's the space geodesy of the asteroid. Uh, okay. Then, then we'll have to, to adapt, uh, we want to adapt uh, this approach for, for this uh, context. Well, I, I talked about validity domain, so we can do that uh, uh, as long as we would like. We, we made two very strong assumptions that we could linearize the things and that we had a propagation model. So, uh, how long is it valid? So, uh, I tried to plot these, uh, so both crit criteria in this chart and uh, uh, so this chart uh, expresses uh, both cri criteria in terms of distance and time tolerances. So uh, the most top right you are, the more comfortable it is to apply uh, the algorithm. Well, if we consider uh, the, the science case for cruise, so the cruise context, uh, well, the, the algorithm was made for that, so it is easy to, uh, it is more adapted to that. Uh, for the other uh, regions, so if you are ver uh, to the left, then you, it means that you, the, you cannot allow the CubeSat to fly too far away in the gravity field it is experiencing, so you have to adapt the propagation model. And if you are too low on that scale, it means that you have to make measurements very quick. And then you have to have multiple optical sensors. So that's the kind of trade-off you, you can have in mind. But also, uh, we, can, uh, we, we can still conclude uh, about uh, what cruise context sensitivity study uh, teaches us. So at first, we are more sensitive longitudinally than transversally. So it's not very surprising, but what is cool is that it, it's also easy to correct. So we, only have to increase uh, by one unknown the state vector that has to be inversed in the triangulation. So it's a relatively small adaptation. Uh, also, uh, the accuracy at the output of the process is strictly proportional to the accuracy of the optical uh, system. Uh, and uh, of course, optical accuracy is the first driver. It means uh, the second driver is the, manage the, is the strategy uh, to select the foreground bodies that has to be observed. So there is here a, a large uh, potential for optimization. And uh, also uh, keep in mind that uh, this kind of filter is uh, really not, not optimized yet, so we can expect also uh, improvements with that. And we have things to investigate, for instance, uh, uh, these criteria align very well on typical orbital uh, velocities. Uh, so velocities that are representative for, for the science case we are emerged into. And uh, so we, are, we have to see how, how we can explain uh, to, we want to be uh, top right, the, the, at the maximum of top right of that, and how it is related to the local, relative, uh, local orbital velocity. So this is another investigation. And also, we have to investigate why the Kaman filter is behaving like that. Uh, it's, it's worse than the raw results, so actually, uh, I should take the average measure here, and then from here, take uh, the Kaman filter result. So, uh, it's too bad. Uh, it, 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 it must be, and it will be optimized. So, that's it. Uh, then, uh, we, we demonstrated that uh, we can expect 100 km accuracy at one sigma already in cruise context. Uh, next steps will be to uh, develop uh, the hardware to demonstrate uh, this optical sensor, so the, the so-called object tracker, uh, with, uh, in order to reach 0.2 arc second accuracy. And uh, we also want to develop the hardware for flight software bench. Uh, then for that, at, uh, in our lab at Paris Observatory, we have a, a flight software architecture bench that can be used and uh, will adapt, we, we have started adapting it to uh, CubeSat ARM architecture, uh, typically. So uh, we will also use uh, this kind of resources. Uh, thank you.
Um, so uh, let's say you're you relying on objects that you know that are in the solar system, for example, so that you may triangulate even uh, the same instant or with asynchronous triangulation. My question is, have you modeled the ephemeris error of this object? Yes. And what? The ephemeris object, mm -hmm. error of this object, so that you know that, for example, an object is there, but with some uncertainty, so that when you are looking at the object, actually, uh, you don't know where it is located. So yes. Yes, it was a system indeed. And uh, uh, again, the, the first driver is really the optical accuracy. The, the knowledge we have, and uh, one of the partners is IMCC. IMCC is a lab at Paris Observatory that is in charge of producing uh, best available ephemerates of solar system objects. So we, we master the, uh, the error of the ephemerates thanks to this uh, contribution. So we, we know how to deal with that. Um, of course, if you are relying on uh, asteroids that are not very well known and, and so on, then it could be bad for one object. But if you are dealing with uh, uh, objects like uh, planets and uh, moons of planets, uh, they are known with uh, meters, meters in the accuracy. So meters at, hand, uh, at uh, a few astronomical units is fair accuracy. Okay, and I have another question is, have you modeled the lifetime error that uh, produces? Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't include it yet because um, uh, uh, it doesn't play a role to assess uh, the, the weight of the, of the error propagation. But you're right, it had to be assessed in order to, uh, it had to be included in order to assess the, the, uh, the full propagation process. Okay, I have not other questions, but maybe we'll talk later. Yeah, with pleasure. Uh, thanks, excellent. Uh, I was just wondering if you add another object tracker or two of them and then one power to get the two improvement too. So. Yes, sure. If you have two object tracker, then you need less time to go from one object to the other object. Then you can you can take advantage of this of this area. So then you you can uh, uh, with all criteria taken a call, you 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 can uh, uh, so you, you don't change anything in the algorithm. You can already uh, use the algorithm. The, the, the algorithm. So, I mean, if you need, if you need to keep measurements in uh, typically uh, in crews, we need five measurements in one hour. So, one measurement every twelve minutes. So that's typically the scenario. So, and why that scenario? Because we need to point. Point and so on. So, if you have several optical sensors, then you can assess that uh, you get you, you got uh, optical measurements every minute, for instance. And if you have them every minute, then the algorithm is valid in a uh, larger validity domain. So, it's more flexible. Thanks. Ideally, it, it, it would be nice to have simultaneous measurements, and then even with five measurements, simultaneous measurements. Uh, then the, the covariance matrix will be excellent. Uh, hello. Well, uh, very nice presentation. I would also like to discuss a little bit more about it later. Um, I was just wondering if you modeled, if you modeled uh, errors in the or a difference between the propagator that you have on board and a real, the real ephemeris uh, uh, model well, the well, matrix in the in reality. So actually, there is uh, a study uh, about the error budgets, all errors that can play a role in that. And uh, we also have uh, started an internship an intern this year, who is, uh, who is uh, assessing every error one by one and to try to, to see if indeed the fault driver is the optical error. So um, well, the suspense is not very high. We, we know that the optical error is the first driver. But we, we want to quantify the contribution of other errors for sure. Yeah. And that's very shortly about the divergence of your common filter. Yes. Um, so in our project, we saw something very similar to this behavior. And one of the solutions that we thought of is providing the, uh, the, the filter with a, a, 
a priori, a priori uh, estimate. So then, you, if you give a, a certain margin of where you you think you will be, then the pro the filter is likely to convert to somewhere in the neighborhood. Uh, thank you very much for the suggestion. Actually, I, I have at the moment this kind of discussions with uh, the experts, and uh, they all told me, uh, to all, all tell me that uh, uh, this is typically a problem of initializing the common filter. So uh, I'm quite optimistic for the next step. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any last final question? Yeah,